All right, my friend, welcome once again to another episode of the Red Delta Project podcast and live feed Q&A here on the Red Delta Project YouTube channel where we take a fundamental approach to simplify this whole fitness thing and give you more power, control, and freedom over your healthy lifestyle. As always, I'm Matt Schifferly, and today's episode is sponsored by the fine folks over at Duonomic. They make these fine doorway-style pull-up grips pull-up handles. They'll Elvia pull-up handles. They're right now running a Black Friday sale, I think until the 1st of December. Plus, if you use the promo code GRINDSTYLE at checkout, you'll get an extra 10% off. Link is down below as well as to other links that help to support the channel. But uh, this is pretty much about the only doorway pull-up style handle or bar, I guess you could call it a bar, that I ever recommend. Very high quality, construction, well-built, and uh, very secure in its use as well. So uh, check that out. Also, you can check out the review I have on the Elvia pull-up handles from Duonomic on the Red Delta Project YouTube channel if you want to learn more about that as well. So are those handles right for you? Are pull-ups right for you? Are push-ups good for you? Or are you better off using maybe dumbbell bench press and so on? That's what we're talking about today with what is the qualities that you want to look for in choosing the best exercises for you. This is kind of going along the theme that we've had over the past several weeks of how do you make a workout program that essentially doesn't suck. And this is now week three, I guess you could look at it that way and uh, check out those other episodes. But now we're looking at, well, what exercises do I choose? And of course, if you go online and you say, what's the best exercise to build a bigger chest? What's the best exercise to jump higher and all these sorts of things? You're going to get a million expert opinions and a million people saying, this is great. And then someone else says, that's a terrible exercise. That's horrible. That doesn't do you any good. And it's bad for your joints. And it just gets run around, run around. And that's because like a lot of advice when it comes to what you optimally actually should be doing online, uh, it's impossible to tell you for sure what you should be doing because Anybody who's writing a blog post or making a YouTube video like this doesn't know you. They don't know the nuances in your life and you, the little things that you bring to the table, like past experience, your skills, your proficiency, your injuries, preferences, resources, all of these things that need to be taken into consideration for you to actually know what is best for you. So when guys like me come up and be like, this is the best exercise ever, know that we are guessing to some degree. We're basing it off of our experience. We're basing it off of evidence-based research and what the data shows. Sure, so we're basing it off all this, but ultimately that stuff doesn't build the bridge across the entire gap from where you are to where you want to be. Instead, you want to be making the call on observing what qualities are going to be present in the exercises that are best for you. And that's what we're going to be exploring today while taking your questions and getting your feedback as well. A couple of people on here right off the bat, uh, Michael Blacktree, hope we had a great, good Thanksgiving. I had a fantastic Thanksgiving there, Michael. I went for an awesome bike ride in the morning. I had a Friendsgiving. I spent the time with a lot of good, close friends of mine. And my Buffalo Bills beat the Saints, <laughs> which made me feel really good and happy as well. Thank you very much for asking. So when it comes down to what is a good exercise versus a bad exercise, a couple of things just stand out stark. The first is that, is it going to directly uh, impact the stimulus that you're hoping to get from it? And you can use a particular exercise and create a variety of stimuli from it. Take, for example, uh, squats. You can program squats to be good for building your legs big, massive Tom Palazzian legs, right? You can program it for better running. You can program it for jumping. You can program it for stronger stance work in the martial arts and stuff. So it's not just what the exercise is, it's how you're programming it and laying out the routine and stuff. And I discussed that in more detail in the previous episodes. So it's not just as simple as you do this exercise, you get this result. That's grossly oversimplifying the impact. It's kind of like picking up a hammer and saying, this hammer is going to empower you to build a birdhouse. Well, it depends on how you use the hammer. You can use that hammer to build the birdhouse. You can also use the same hammer to smash the birdhouse into a thousand pieces. You can use it for constructive or destructive purposes. And the same thing is with exercise. 
you don't just get a result because you do a particular exercise. It's how you're programming it. However, when it comes to, well, which ones are going to give me the best chance of being constructive and productive, you want to look at what kind of a stimulus can you create. And in my book, Micro Workouts, I talk about the three primary stimuli that you can create. It's either stimuli to improve proficiency and how well you do uh, something and how well you're using your body, <clears throat> like how well can you jump? How well can you run? How well can you shoot a basketball? The skill, in other words, how much you can improve your work capacity. And this is usually more in line if you're trying to build up muscle. Uh, so that's how you build muscles. You challenge the work capacity of muscle. You can do that any kind of exercise. It really isn't that important. I don't care what exercise you do or what program you're using and all that sort of thing. As long as you're making the muscle work either harder or longer or a combination of the two, you're going to create a stimulus for hypertrophy. And of course, then there's also the stimuli for just burning calories. And of course, you can do that any way that you like uh, because everything burns calories. But it's basically how long can you do the activity, how intensely, and just how much muscle are you engaging. So let's take, for example, we want to build up our chest. It's like, I want to build up my chest. What can I do? Well, we can look at a lot of exercises that work the chest or in other words, also use the chest. This is something that I get asked all the time. It's like someone so says this works, this muscle, like more importantly to say it uses the muscle. Uh, someone asked me a few weeks ago of like farmer carries that work everything. So can you build up a really big beefy chest with farmer carries? It's like, it might be more of an appropriate way to phrase it of saying farmer carries use the chest rather than work it. Back in my early days when I was doing martial arts, I really fell in love with the idea of, yeah, Taekwondo works the entire body. It uses every single muscle. So therefore I'm getting a full complete workout and I should be basically looking like uh, someone from Dragon Ball Z if I go to Taekwondo class, because it works every muscle. My instructor said it works every muscle. It's like, yeah, but it might be more appropriate to say it uses every muscle. I use my chest to throw a punch, but is that working the muscle the same way as like a heavy set of dips or bench press or chest flies or something along those lines. Not really. So there's a big difference between using the muscle and working the muscle. So that's the first thing we want to look for is, is it working the muscle in the way that we want to in order to create the stimuli that we're after? Because you can use your muscles all day long, but if it's not adequately working it, it's not really going to get you very far. So are we working for either trying to improve how well we can do something, the work capacity of the muscle, or uh, just burning calories? Now, burning calories is not really a, much of an example uh, for this case because I don't care how hard you work your chest. It's a relatively small muscle group. You're never really going to burn a whole lot with that. Probably not much of a consideration. Let's talk proficiency. Okay, So that is part of it. Like you can only work a muscle to the degree you can proficiently engage it. If you have trouble engaging the muscle, forget it. Nothing you do will ever work. I don't care how many reps you do and how much weight you lift. If you're like doing an exercise and the muscle is just kind of, are we doing something? Are, are we working? I, I think we feel a little bit of a warmth, maybe a little burn. No, you want something that's going to be like a punch to the jaw of that muscle and be like, oh my God, oh man, it's like it's on fire. Oh, it's cramping up. Years ago, uh, this is uh, kind of, uh, I'm sure Zach probably has forgotten about this, but it's one of my stark uh, memories is that uh, I had, uh, I went to one of the underground strength certifications and we were learning how to use kettlebells, which that was a, a lesson in and of itself. Like, no, you can't learn to adequately use kettlebells through YouTube videos. You need to be in person because as soon as I started to gain instruction in person, I realized very quickly, I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, but uh, we were holding the kettlebell in a rack position, right? And very tight, nice and close in and stuff like that. And my chest kept cramping. And I'm like, I'm not even doing any sort of exercise for the chest. Why is my chest cramping? It's because I was perpetually keeping that adduction of my arm going on. And my chest was cramping because it never worked that hard. Now, at that time, I was doing all sorts of bench press and heavy dips and all that sort of thing. But I wasn't very good at using my chest muscles. And as a result, all that stuff was basically not doing much of anything at all. But then as soon as I started holding my kettlebell here, it was like, oh, oh my God, mercy, mercy, ah, uncle, uncle, oh my God, I've never worked this hard. So 
I should have been smart enough to know it's like, oh, hey, this is telling me something about how to use my chest. But at the time I was under the idea of like bench press works at chest, best press, best chest exercise. I will keep doing that, even though I could spend an entire afternoon on the bench press. And if you asked me, is that working your chest? I would be like, uh, I guess, sort of, sure. However, when I started to understand about keeping things in center line and stuff, started doing more narrow grip push-ups and stuff, my chest was on fire. It was crazy. I would get a pump from doing just 10 push-ups. Like, oh my gosh, my chest is killing me. That's a sign that we want from our muscles when we're trying to work the work capacity. We want to feel them working. I know a lot of people out there will say, it's not important how it feels. Bullshit. It's entirely down to how it feels. If you don't feel it working adequately, it's not working adequately enough. Saying how a muscle feels isn't important is like telling a chef that how their dish tastes is irrelevant. That's the whole point. Generating the muscle tension in the muscles and getting them to control it is entirely the point of that exercise. If that's not your objective, you're basically just running around doing random whatever without any rhyme or reason behind your choices. Michael's in the house. Good to see you, Michael. <clears throat> Outcast uh, Ultra asking, when I do chest with push-ups, it feels so hard to feel it in the chest. And when I do it, it's just a little uh, for like one minute. So yeah, it's always, remember uh, this also thing, a uh, little footnote here. Never put the exercise in charge of working your muscles. Never. Never. The exercise is not responsible for your muscle activation, period. Okay. So that it's a part of our vocabulary vernacular now of like this exercise works this muscle. This exercise will build this muscle. This exercise will do this to this muscle. That's not fundamentally how muscles work. Muscles don't engage to do exercise. Okay. So the exercise is not in charge of how your muscles are engaged. Your brain is. Your muscles engage and they contract because your brain tells them to turn on, not because of the exercise. You can make it a little easier, and that's kind of where I'm going with this topic, is you may find it engages better with some exercises than others. Like for me, back in the day, if I was doing bench press on a barbell, I barely felt it in the chest. But if I did it on dumbbells, much more in the chest. So what do you do? Do you go with the power lifters like bench press, best chest exercise ever? Or do you go with what feels like it's working the muscle better? The answer is you go with what feels like it's working the muscle better. You go off of your experience, not what someone else's opinion is. So the point is that when we are saying I do this, but the muscle's not engaging, it's always our fault. Okay, if When I'm on the bench press, I'm like, I don't feel it in the chest very much. It's nothing to do with the exercise. It's because I don't know what I'm doing in order to engage my chest very well on the bench press. Probably something to do with my shoulders aren't packed enough. I'm not squeezing in with my arms. I don't have enough adductive tension going on, which is why when I held that kettlebell in my arm, I had a lot of adductive force going through my chest to keep everything in, which is why my chest was going nuts. But I never thought to do that and squeeze in while I'm doing the bench press. Same thing with push-ups, right? Squeezing in, we wanna be a student of how our muscles are working and then apply that knowledge of this is what the muscle does, how do I use the muscle in that way into that exercise? You don't do the exercise to use the muscle. You use the muscle to do the exercise. It's the other way around. And we all, especially some of us, need to just get better at doing that. Most of us are not born uh, with the knowledge and the ability to use our muscles very well. I'm just gonna say it flat out. Most of us don't know how to use our muscles very well. We understand how to use them proficiently enough so we can walk around and pick something up off a shelf. But when it comes to really working a muscle, most of us are just flat out bad at it because we've never been taught we need to learn how to do that. But once we improve on that, everything you do works a hell of a lot better. Any exercise works a lot better. And that's why when you're learning those things, if you find an exercise like when with me on the dumbbell bench press, like, okay, I feel it in the chest much more on the dumbbell bench press. The smart thing in that case isn't to say dumbbell bench press is better. It's dumbbell bench press is better now, but what am I doing different between the two? Because fundamentally, you should be doing the same thing. 
ideally, whenever we're doing fundamental movement patterns, there shouldn't be a difference. There shouldn't be much of a difference. But if there is, that's something we're doing that's making a difference. If we don't understand what that is, the ability to effectively work the muscle is largely up to chance. Formalists is saying, yes, mind and muscle are inseparable. Absolutely. That's why they call it the neuromuscular system. It's not just the muscular system. It's the neuromuscular system. Sneaky is coming on as saying, hey, Matt, one of my fears with leg training is the fear that heavy legs would hold me back in calisthenics. Can this really happen or can I build both upper body uh, strength and big legs? Absolutely. In fact, when I got into calisthenics training, it was my legs that had the biggest improvement. You know, when I when I started, I back in the day, I thought, okay, I'm going to try this convict conditioning book that I had picked up. I'm going to do nothing but calisthenics for a month. If I'm lucky, I'll maintain some of my lower body strength. And by the end of that month, it was my legs that actually grew stronger and bigger by far than anything else. And so that's why whenever people are like, I, you can't get big, strong legs with calisthenics, I'm like, then you're doing something wrong because I can, there are plenty of leg exercises that can certainly work your legs adequately enough. And if you don't have it, come find me. I will show you. <laughs> I will definitely give you some fun things to work on. But uh, yeah, I my opinion on things is build. Like uh, in calisthenics, people will shy away and they're like, I don't want big, heavy, strong legs because that's going to hold me back. My response is hold back, hold back. I want every mechanical disadvantage I can possibly afford myself when it comes to my strength and conditioning. Now, it's different if you're in calisthenic sport. If you're in a contest and you're like, I'll win a million dollars if I can do 30 straight pull-ups, I'm like, dude, we got to get your legs skinny as hell. You know, yeah, let's get them tiny, tiny, tiny. But I'm not in exercise for the performance aspect. I want my numbers low. I want to suck at my strength training because I have every mechanical disadvantage because what does that do? It makes the muscles work harder. I want the exercise to be brutally hard on my muscles. I don't want efficiency. So in my case, it'd be like big legs, hell yeah. The more weight I got to lift, the better. But if you build bigger legs, you won't be able to do as many pull-ups. Awesome. Great. That's exactly what I want. <clears throat> Formless One is chiming in on this. Have you seen the street calisthenics guy, semi-locks? No. Uh, rip right? Yes, absolutely. And, I'm, and I am the proof. Uh, you should. No BS exercises. Simple eating. Absolutely. There's no, that's how, how we shoot straight. Yeah, Rip Right is a, uh, I like to follow them on, on the Instagram. I mean, to be perfectly honest, folks, I spend so little time on um, social media and uh, and stuff like that. So I usually don't get a whole lot of, uh, um, you know, attention to such things because I'm paying more attention to the stuff I'm doing rather than what other people are doing. Um, <clears throat> bit of a random question, Sam Armstrong coming on. Uh, what does... Uh, but does crossing the legs during pull-ups make them less effective? They feel a lot easier to do than keeping the legs straight or bent in front of me. So what you're probably doing, it's not so much the cross, it's the bend in your knees that's probably getting it. So when we do pull-ups, and this is, again, how we can adjust mechanical positioning of the body to adjust the difficulty of things. And me personally, whenever I find something, it's like if I cross it, it's easier. If my legs are straight, it's harder. So what am I going to do? Keep them straight. <laughs> like, I don't want easier. I want to make the exercise harder. That's why when people say, Matt, can you do 100 push-ups? I'm like, God, I sure as hell hope not. <laughs> you know, why would I ever want push-ups that are that easy? You know, whenever I'm doing my own workouts, if I'm warming up and I hit like nine reps, I'm like, all right, that's enough of that nonsense. Come on, let's make it hard now. You know, I could do more, but do I want to? Hell no. I want it hard. I go after the intensity. But yeah, I would bet money that it's because your knees are bending, not the fact that you're crossing your ankles. So what's going on is you're bringing your weight back a little bit. You're tilting yourself forward. So your torso is at a slight angle and you're uh, able to engage your upper back just a smidge more. And because you're engaging a little bit more muscle, that's why it's a little bit easier. So it's just altering your center of gravity just a little bit more. So uh, there's two ways you could take this is... Uh, Keep doing it just like that. Upper back involvement, great. We want to work our muscle very effectively. 
Uh, but try and when your legs are straight, be mindful of really packing your shoulders back as much as you can. Exaggerate it. And that should uh, help uh, decrease uh, the difference there as well. <clears throat> So uh, this next question actually comes up with a, a good one here. Lower back sort of flares when I sit for long periods of time. So I know this is kind of like I'm, I'm reaching out here at, at an example. But when we do our exercises, not only do you want to feel really good with the exercise, but you want to do things that are relatively comfortable in the joints. You don't want to be doing things that it's like, well, this is the greatest exercise in the world, but boy, I don't know the strain and it doesn't even have to hurt. It's just kind of like, oh, my lower back or my knees or my shoulder or something just kind of feels a little not quite 100% with this. That's usually a sign it's not quite the best thing. We want exercises that feel very, very comfortable on everything in the body so it can be as hard as possible on the muscle because your nervous system is going to prioritize your safety over your gains. So that every ounce of energy you have to spend towards keeping you from, you know, going a little too far and putting yourself at risk is something that's taken away from your ability to really push the muscle. But anyway, lower back flares, sort of flares, I said for long periods of time, any stretch or exercise you recommend, I would say uh, focus on trying to get the glutes and the hamstrings engaged. So what's probably going on when you're sitting for long periods of time is you are experiencing a chronic anterior uh, pelvic tilt. So your pelvis is tilting this way and it's crunching the lower back. Same thing happens with people who stand for a long period of time. It's not so much the sitting, it's the still part of that. Kneeling still, standing still, sitting still. So when we're still for long periods, if we're not really engaging our glutes and hamstrings enough to pull our pelvis down into more of a neutral tilt or even a slight posterior tilt, then you're gonna have that pinchingness and you can stretch it out all day long it might offer temporary relief, but it's not going after the actual tension that's causing the problem. So that's why I would recommend making glute hamstring stuff uh, part of your daily practice. Things like uh, some of the isometrics I have in grindstyle calisthenics, standing next to a wall and just driving your heel, uh, the back of your heel against a wall to light up the glutes and the hamstrings. If you have a little bit of a break and you can get down on the floor, some hip bridges can be a good way to go about it as well. So glutes and hamstrings, basically, and you wanna make it more habitual. So even as I'm standing here, I have a standing desk that I'm recording the podcast on, like my glutes and hamstrings are on, like they are on. I My backside feels like it's at the top of a deadlift right now. I'm not relaxed. So you want to engage those glutes and hamstrings habitually all the time. And that will, again, keep that pelvic tilt more neutral and take care of some of the stress in the lower back. But yeah, we want to address these sorts of things. It's a funny thing that when you find an exercise that addresses weaknesses that you may have, it should feel like you're kind of like you're scratching an itch. Not like you have a literal itch, but it's just like, oh my gosh, where has this been all of my life? There have been several times in my training career where I've found an exercise that addresses something I didn't know I needed. And it's just like, oh my gosh, that feels just so incredibly good because it's addressing something that needed to be addressed and now you're getting more imbalance. The bottom line is effective exercises feel good. Effective training feels good. Don't give in too much credibility to this idea of it's gotta be blood, sweat and tears and horrible and all. Uh, awful and stuff like that. We were talking last week during the episode where uh, we had someone jump on and it was talking about, I hate exercise. I'm like, that's a big problem because exercise should be rewarding. Not even just, you know, it's rewarding for the results or, oh, it feels so good afterwards. It should be rewarding in the actual activity itself. And if it's not, something needs to be addressed, maybe a different exercise or how we are doing it as well. So Milana, uh, coming on asking, hey, Matt, in the last podcast, hey, yeah, uh, you talked about time and tension. If I want to achieve two pull-ups, what should I focus on? Uh, doing two pull-ups. So time and tension, yeah, fundamentally, that's all muscle is, uh, working a muscle, because your muscles only have those two variables, uh, With uh, especially when it comes to like the work capacity of the muscle. You have how much tension is in the muscle and how much time are you working it on. So if you want to achieve more, you need more of both. You need more time and tension in order to 
achieve more repetitions, especially lower reps like that. You know, going from two to three, that is a huge jump. There's percentage wise, it's very difficult because going from two to three percentage wise is massive. What is that like 50% increase in your work capacity? But going from like, you know, 18 to 19, that's a much smaller percentage. So you need to both get a lot stronger and have more endurance. So you want to practice both exercises that can really push a little bit more on the endurance side of things. So seated pull-ups, jackknife pull-ups, some people call them rows, anything that gets the back working longer, but also really, really hard strength wise. But if you're doing things in the two rep range, you're already working strength. So that should be something that goes along, but maybe isometrics would also be a good way to go about it because nothing is going to challenge your strength like overcoming isometrics because it's always matching resistance to maximal strength every single time. So I would uh, warm up with a couple of isometric sets, iso trainer, iso loop, that sort of thing, uh, and uh, do some rows um, also as just a, you can do it as a warm up, but don't fatigue yourself too much. And uh, it's going to be one of those things that uh, you want to save plenty of energy for your two repetitions. And lastly, you can also improve the endurance by um, you're get, trying to get two. So on that last one, you come down really, really, really slow, or you can hold the top isometrically for a five count or something. So the amount of time you're spending on that second rep can be longer. So it's just the muscles working harder for a longer period of time. You may not be moving, but it doesn't matter uh, because tension is tension and time is time. And if there's more tension and there's more time, then it's the same thing fundamentally as doing more repetitions. And that's how you will be able to progress that sort of thing. So now we're talking programming and stuff like, okay, we have the exercise pull-ups, but how do we program and we, we change out the recipe? But on the other hand, if they said, okay, pull-ups, but you know, I don't feel the muscle working. It's problematic on my grip. I'm not really feeling like I can do much with this. It's like, it's probably not the right exercise for you. Maybe we should go with more of rows. Maybe, uh, you know, if you're like, I'm just so sick of pull-ups, they're like, okay, let's do some dumbbell rows or something. We could do a lot of different things that are still fundamentally the same movement chain, but we are using different techniques. Giovanni asking, uh, hey, I'm going to be uh, going back to the gym for the first time in a while. Welcome back. Do you have any resources or links, warm-ups, routines for beginners just trying to get back to the gym after some bad injuries. Well, I'm sorry to hear that you had some bad injuries there, uh, Giovanni. That sucks, but uh, well done on you for getting back to it because a lot of people never get back to it. I was telling this to the class the other day. I was like, a lot of people never intend to quit their fitness journey. They never intend to quit. They always just, quote, take a break. And then the break just keeps extending until it becomes their normal. And then they look up one day and they're like, I guess I've quit. So congratulations on coming back. I applaud you for that. It shows much inner strength. Uh, so I would say just start with whatever type of movements you had been doing, but scale it back because really, I mean, advice for beginners is largely worthless. You know, you you, you hear that a lot of, on things on the internet, like this, do this for beginners and push up for beginners. And I even have a book called Calisthenics for Beginners. I didn't even come up with that title. I hate that title. It's a stupid title. But the publisher is the one who came up with that because there's no such thing as a beginner. <laughs> you are coming back to the gym. That means you're not a beginner. <laughs> you're not a beginner. You have experience. I've been training people for nearly 20 years now. There's never, ever once been a standard beginner that's been in front of me. Everyone is who's saying, I'm a beginner. I'm like, well, you're going to be different from every other beginner I've had. So that's why advice for beginners is always kind of crappy advice. Instead, you base things off of your current level of ability. So it's like, well, I don't know if I can, you know, back squat 225 like I did last time. Okay, we'll start with a bodyweight squat. And it's like, how does that feel? Maybe your injuries were in your knees or something like that. Probably we're already doing rehab. Build off of what you were doing in rehab. And it's like, okay, well, leg press I feel a little more comfortable with. Let me try just the sled. There you go. Eh, it felt kind of easy. Let me put a little bit more on. And away you go. So base it off of your ability for the day. And that's not just in your current state. That's always, when you go to the gym, I don't work out according to a plan. I work out according to my capability for that day. If I'm behind the eight ball, I'm not gonna like, okay, here we go. Trying for a one-arm pull-up, let's go. 
But at the same time, it's like, if I'm ready to crush and smash and bash it, I'm like, dude, let's just jump right into the weighted dips. Let's go. So base it off of your ability. And uh, that goes for uh, everything that you're doing. Let me get caught back up to some of these comments and questions here. Michael Blacktree. Hey, Matt, I can do one arm push-ups in rows. Awesome. But can't do one arm pull-ups yet. Is that normal? Absolutely. Because think about it. Your rows and your push-ups are working with a fraction of your body weight. Uh, I forget what the math is, but it's somewhere around like 60%, 65%, depending on various factors. Uh, but pull-ups are 100%. So uh, one-arm pull-up is stupid, insanely hard compared to one-arm push-ups and, uh, and stuff like uh, the rows and things. So, you know, it's kind of like I can, you know, lift 50 pounds. How come I can't wait lift 300 yet? I'm like, it's a big gap. It's a very, very big gap. So you still have some work to do, but it's perfectly normal. Uh, Kivan asking, hey, Matt, I've started a new job and having to work long hours. I hear you, man. Uh, I'm a house painter. Oh, wow. Well, good on you for being a house painter. I am losing too much muscle and weight with the job. Yeah, because you are burning like crazy and I eat more calories, do less workouts during the week. Yeah, so it's, it's a combination of things. You're, you have a very physically demanding job. Uh, so that's putting a huge caloric demand on your body. And... Uh, don't underestimate that. Like a lot of times we typically associate caloric demand with physical exercise. And this is a big mistake I used to make because back in high school, uh, I used to have a lot of physically demanding jobs. My first job ever was washing cars by hand at a Volvo dealership. And so I would go to work with a, like a sack lunch, little brown bag lunch that probably had enough to tide me over till 10 a.m. Yeah, and this was a job that lasted till 6 p.m. And I always, at the time, I had the mentality of like, don't eat too much, don't eat too much, you don't want to eat too much. I should have been tripling that caloric load. But I thought it didn't matter because it wasn't exercise. It wasn't really that physically demanding, but you're physically active for hours at a time. Years later, uh, I had a job uh, working, building fitness equipment. And I learned now in my lesson, trial and error, that sometimes uh, we would be building these weight machines, you know, four or five stack weight machines that would literally be turning wrenches, squatting down, picking up pieces of metal and stuff for eight hours straight. And I learned on those days, you know, my boss would be like, okay, we're building a Batka five stack, yada, yada. I'm like, okay. And that morning I'd go to Subway and get two of the footlongs plus a couple of candy bars, plus, you know, plenty to drink and stuff. And I'd eat the whole thing during my shift. Because I learned that those days are like, that's probably going to be a 4,000 calorie day. So with you being a painter, you're probably going to need to eat a good amount. And the other thing too, as you mentioned, is your physical uh, workouts are pew, dropping uh, significantly. So check out my uh, a couple of my resources for micro workouts, right? Because you have very little time. You also have very little energy because it's being used up by your job. I got my book, Micro Workouts. It's down below in the description. I also have my micro workouts playlist on the Red Delta Project YouTube channel with lots of workouts there. Literally things that just take a few minutes, but it's still going to create a hypertrophy stimulus so you can still build some muscle from it or at least stave off the uh, sarcopenia that you're experiencing right now. So micro workouts and eat well, my friends. Don't be shy with those calories. Pack a big size lunch. And don't worry, like, I got to eat clean and stuff. Grab a damn Snickers bar. You know, have a cheeseburger and stuff. We need to get those calories coming on in. And it's usually easier with foods that aren't as clean and stuff. Uchahin. Hey, Matt, when doing isometric holds, is it essential to consider multiple angles of a movement pattern? Um, I would say not really. Uh, not a whole lot. Unless you specifically want to make sure you're developing strength in a particular angle. Like I, I'm trying to think of an example and I'm drawing a blank, but let's say you just, I need to be as strong as possible with my arms at exactly this angle. Then yeah, I would say, make sure you're hitting that angle. But this is a big myth in isometric training is that if you train a muscle at an angle, then you're only developing strength there, but you're not developing strength anywhere else. It's a complete myth. It's a complete utter myth. Yes, there's some research that says you have most of your or more of your strength here and a little tiny itty bitty bit less at the other angles, but you're talking to such a small degree, it doesn't even matter, right? Now, the example that I uh, uh, learned from this one was my hip strength. 
my hip isometrics that I do is I stand next to a wall, like I was talking about earlier, using the glutes and the hamstrings. And I just push my foot against the wall using my hip muscle. Now I'm keeping my foot, not even a foot above the ground. Like here on camera, you can see I'm barely lifting my leg up, but the amount of strength I have in my sidekicks at this height is phenomenally improved. I never train my leg that high. That's because a muscle is strengthened when it's tense and it doesn't really have that much of a reference point as far as length goes. So for the most part, I tell people, don't worry about it. <laughs> Just find that angle that you can really engage the muscle on and work it there. And sometimes you may find that you just have trouble engaging a muscle at a, a elongated position. And that's very normal. Like people will do pull-ups and they get to a point and they just drop because they don't have the proficiency to keep their muscle engaged in that elongated position. In which case I'd say, okay, let's work on engaging your muscle when it's elongated like that. But that's not about, it's not strong there. It's just, you don't know how to engage it properly at that position, which is still very important. So definitely train that. But if you don't need that, don't worry about it. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this is, again, why we may choose one exercise versus another. We want to be very particular about why we're doing it. We don't want to base it off of just, well, this exercise is supposed to be the best. We want to have a particular objective and then select the right tool for the job, not just grabbing a hammer at random and saying, oh, I guess this will just work for me. Well, these recommendations I'm basing things off of, it's like, what are we trying to accomplish? And then what might fit the bill best rather than just assuming what's best and crossing our fingers and just hoping for the best. Santiago, California. Hey, Matt. Trying to optimize my recovery. Uh, good luck with that. <laughs> Is it okay to move from a push-pull leg split to a full body or even upper or lower? Yeah, sure thing. Do whatever the hell you want. Um, honestly, I don't think it's going to really matter. Uh, to a large degree, but uh, this is, and that's why I'd say, yeah, good luck with that because optimal recovery requires a lifestyle most of us can't have. Now, this time of year, I was telling a client today, I was like, people, the weekend of Thanksgiving or just the week after Thanksgiving, PRs all over the place. Why? Because at least here in the United States, we have this holiday on Thursday called Thanksgiving, which is just, you get the time off work and you eat a lot and everything like that. So it's like, think about it this way. We've had four days. We're eating a lot of good food. We're hopefully seriously decreasing stress in our life. And we're getting a lot more sleep and rest and R&R. &R. Now, if that's not a formula for recovery, I don't know what is. However, this is also a time it's like, do I expect to have this all the time? No. Do I expect to even have this much of the time? Absolutely not. Because I have life to attend to uh, during this holiday weekend. We're like, okay, life time out. This is why professional athletes, you know, they'll have services. They'll have people doing the laundry for them and cleaning their house for them and all these sorts of things. Cause that way, the less you have to attend to uh, that's uh, placing stress on mind, body and lifestyle, the better your recovery will be. So anyway, long speech, I know, sorry to drown on a, a little bit like that. But um, yeah, I don't really think the workout routine you, you choose, the splits and stuff is really going to matter at all. Uh, largely because it's like, you know, you drop a glass on the floor, it smashes. Does it matter if it's on a Tuesday or a Wednesday? <laughs> Does it matter if you do it once a week or twice a week kind of thing? Like when we are looking at creating a stimulus, it's like driving in that nail. You just, muscles are like nails. You just got to hit them. I don't care how and I don't care when and stuff. Just hit the damn thing. And if you need more time to recover, recover. I don't care if you have a what kind of split you're following. If you find you can get better recovery from one split for whatever reason, then go for it. But I would honestly say I think you're splitting hairs. Just do whatever uh, feels best for you. I don't think it's going to matter much. Michael Stokes, any tips on how to keep your feet flat when doing any sort of squatting? I always end up on the balls of my feet. Yeah, squatting. Uh, so this is where the proficiency comes in. So here we have the application of the exercise. So we're talking about squatting. So this is one of those cases where the exercise you do really matters. Uh, because when it comes to, I want to build muscle, do whatever. You know, I really don't care what exercise you do. I don't care what exercise, what equipment you use. As long as it's in the basic fundamental movement pattern, it really doesn't matter. However, when the goal is a particular type of proficiency, 
particularly with the exercise. Like I want to get better at squatting. Okay, then we need to squat. If you came to me and said, I just want to get stronger legs, I don't care if you never squat a day in your life. It really isn't that important because we can just work your legs somehow. Is it working hard? Yes, good. That checks the only box we need to check off. But when it comes to, I need to get good at this particular exercise, then it matters. So in this case, what you want to be doing is shifting squats. So your heels are coming up because of a challenge to have mobility and stability and to a certain degree, maybe strength in that position. So shifting squats are a staple for grind style calisthenics where you get into a squat position and you literally just move around in that position. You go side to side, your knees in, knees out, knees in, knees out, go up on the balls of your feet, come back on your heels, balls of your feet, heels, twisting around. So usually what ends up happening with strength training is we get very, very ingrained into our movement pattern and we're greasing a groove, but it's a very narrow groove. And this is why a lot of times people will try to optimize their strength and performance in one particular movement. And then they end up actually hurting themselves as soon as they go outside that movement. It used to happen to me all the time. I'd get on like, you know, the bench press and my hands would always be in the same place. I'd always be doing the exact same thing, but ask me to throw a Frisbee and ah, oh, God, my shoulder, oh, because I didn't train my arm to be strong here. I trained it to be strong in only one position. And this is one of the benefits of calisthenics is we can shift and what I call widen your base of support, like spreading out cookie dough, right? So your legs are strong and stable and mobile and functionally uh, capable of being in a wide variety of positions. And you're coming up on the balls of your feet because you're only able to use your legs in a very narrow range of positions. So by using those shifting squats, it's just like rolling out that cookie dough over time. And that's going to give you that ability to get down with your heels uh, as well as open up those hips and make the squats a lot stronger in general. So shifting squats, again, selecting the exercise based on what do we need to work on. I'm not going to give just random, like you could go online and be like, someone's like, oh, single leg, leg press is the best thing in the world. But if it's not addressing the actual functional demand that we're looking for, it's not going to be the best way to go about it. GTRE, how's it going? Hey, Matt, what do you think about working out same muscle group every day if you feel you can? Yeah, you can do anything you want every single day. Remember, you never have to recover from exercise. You never have to recover from working out. Why? Because fundamentally, there's no such thing as exercise. There's no such thing as working out. The only thing the body knows is functional demand. We use our body and it's like, what do you need me to do? You need me to do this? Okay, do this kind of thing. So that's what your body's adapting to. It's like, what do you need me to do, man? What are you asking me to do? And if I can't quite do it, then I'll adapt so you can do it. That's all exercise is, is placing a functional demand on the body. So you can do anything you want every single day. It's fine. We recover not from exercise, but from fatigue and stress, and damage, and all these other sorts of things. And that's what you want to be mindful of. So if you want to do something every day, you just work out in a way that doesn't cause too much stress and damage and fatigue. It's that simple. It's usually down to volume. It's like, I want to do it every day. Okay, do a little bit less because you've got the stress and then the recovery cycle. So if you stress out a lot, and then you have several days of recovering, you have a big cycle. If you stress out a little and then you recover quickly every day or every other day, you're just shrinking the cycle. Fundamentally, you're not doing anything different. You're just shrinking down that cycle a little bit. So just don't have as much stress. And of course, that depends on conditioning. That depends on your environment. That depends on a whole host of factors. But yeah, less stress, less recovery. Go for it. Do whatever you want every single day. It's perfectly fine. Hey, Matt. I'm 62 years old, five foot seven. Hey, uh, 160 pounds can do 10 strict reps, pull ups. Very good. With a 25 pound plate on, fantastic. Well above average. 50 full range unbroken push ups, uh, bench 160, 185. Congratulations, Tony. So, yeah, we have to uh, give ourselves these pats on the back. You, Tony, I mean, you've been, you're 62 years old. This is not stuff you accomplished overnight. This is stuff that came from a lot of experience. And therefore, you know, we should all listen to what Tony has to say here, folks, because when someone that old, I'm not saying you're old, Tony, sorry, that much experience, excuse me, comes on, like, 
you don't have much of that in our fitness culture. Most people burn out and their fitness career is done within five to 10 years. So being 62, I'm guessing that's more than 10 years of experience, which is not common. So we should listen to Tony and what he has to say. <laughs> Bastian, hey, how's it going, man? Love the human flag there. I remember that picture. I remember seeing that. How's it going? I'm currently in high school. So I spend many hours studying. I had to move my workouts later in the day. Fine. Finish around 11 p.m. Oh, I know how that goes. Oh, what do you suggest? Cheers. Uh, so yeah, that could be quite challenging. Uh, I had the same thing in school. You know, it's like, okay, time to start my workout. And it's 1030 at night. Okay, time to get this going. Um, I mean, school is is tough because your your days are all over the place. It's kind of cluster of fluff. It's kind of like you're one of those serial entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley kind of thing. Yeah, just get it in when you can with what you can do, you know, and uh, if that's what you get it in, that's when you get it in. The, the biggest challenge when you're in school is just getting enough sleep. <laughs> that's the biggest thing. Like study, yes, get your workouts in, great, wonderful, but try your best to not sacrifice sleep. To be perfectly honest with you, my entire college career, I only pulled three all-nighters and not a single one of them was for studying. It was all about partying or trying to finally score with some gal, which a couple of times it actually worked, but I never stayed up past midnight studying because I knew that once I, or oftentimes even 10, 8, 10 p.m., it's like after that, my brain's just mush. I'm like, I'm not retaining any of this. Go to bed. It's like, I'm probably going to fail tomorrow, but should have studied earlier or something like that. Make sleep a priority. I feel like in school, sleep is the throwaway resource that we have. And I, I don't think that's a smart thing. Prioritize sleep and everything else will be much more in, uh, in alignment. <clears throat> Azrael, do you use gymnastic rings? Yes, yeah, I got them right behind me there. I know I've got the blurry background here, but yeah, I've got some new rings I've been playing around with from, uh, it's a new product, not out on the market. Just, I know there's people always have rings out, but uh, new new ring product coming out fairly soon. Hopefully they will be uh, giving me the go ahead to release their review on uh, on sort of things. Uh, Adim asking, will weighted push-ups increase bench press? It should. Now, here's the thing that uh, gets uh, talked about a lot and debated a lot, and it's usually a complete waste of time, is the back and forth between uh, calisthenics progression and weighted progression. Because you're going to find examples all over the place of people like, I did calisthenics and my weightlifting improved. And you're going to find tons of people saying, I did weightlifting and my calisthenics improved. And then you're going to find people on both sides going, I did calisthenics and it didn't improve it. Or weightlifting and it didn't improve my calisthenics. That's always the fault of the user. It has nothing to do with the exercises. Okay. Your ability to get strong depends on you and how well you're doing the exercise. If you do something that's fundamentally the same movement pattern and it doesn't carry over, you're missing something. There's something you're not doing that's carrying over from that. You should have a good carryover. Strength in a horizontal press should improve strength in a horizontal press of everything to some degree. If there's not, something you're doing is missing in one of those. It could be a structural thing. It could be a stability thing, uh, something about your shoulders hunching up. Something's not quite changing over. But you should certainly, if you have, uh, if you improve the strength in a fundamental movement pattern in a method, it should improve that same fundamental movement pattern in all methods. <clears throat> Cameron doesn't seem to be working for me, but I think I have bad service. <laughs> Sorry about that, Best Nightmare. I, it could always be on my end, too. Um, I was having some Zoom, uh, some connectivity issues earlier today. I reset my modem and everything like that. So uh, hopefully it's uh, not on my end. I tried to bump this thing up to be as fast as possible for these things. Isaac, how's it going, Isaac? Good to talk to you. If I'm overreached on Monday and did way too much pull-up volume, but normally I do two pull-up days a week, should I skip a second day or should I lower volume sets uh, that day? You could do either, really. Um, so this is again, training according to your condition. So he's basically saying I did a lot on Monday and I have it scheduled for, let's say Thursday and to do pull-ups, but I'm not quite recovered. So generally when in doubt, I would say recover more because that's how I train. I don't train to any sort of weekly routine or program. I just simply let my muscles recover. And I only train when I feel like I can crush the workout. So if it comes on Thursday, I'm like, eh, I'm still a little behind the eight ball muscles, not quite there. Yeah, I'll give it another day. Why not? Because if you remember, you don't get results from hard work. 
I don't care how hard your muscles are working, you get results by making your muscles do more than before. So you could crush that pull-up workout, but if your numbers are down and your sets are down and you're not as good in range and your technique is sloppier, you just wasted a workout because you just spent a lot of effort to do not as much performance. Think about it this way. If I said, okay, I will pay you more money every time you run around the track faster. But if you don't run around the track faster, you don't make any money. It's like, well, I just ran around that track and it was, oh my God, it was so hard. My legs were burning and I was so out of breath and stuff. I was like, yeah, but it wasn't faster. You don't get any extra money. So you're like, well, if I'm only going to be paid if I run faster, well, I'm going to give myself the best chance to run a faster lap. So I want to rest up so I can crush the hell out of it. It's the same mentality we want to have. So I would rest um, and give yourself the best chance of progression in the next day. Drop weight daddy, Mike goes in the house. Hey, Matt, cycling question. Is it less safe to allow a uh, knee bend past 90 degrees or should be a 90 degree limit pedaling safely? Oh yeah, definitely more than 90 is fine. I mean, hell, you know, these days we got dropper seat posts, you know, so you're going to be way below 90 degrees. My new mountain bike, you know, the dropper on that thing is insane. So for those who don't know what a dropper is, uh, new mountain bikes now have a switch on the handlebar so you can shrink down the seat. So it's kind of like you, you, as if you didn't have the seat raised on the mountain bike, what that does is it lowers your center of gravity, gives you more of a mobility kind of thing. So basically, whenever I'm going downhill, I'm bending way more than 90 degrees. I'm practically eating my knees whenever I'm riding downhill because I got the seat post down. Perfectly fine and safe. Uh, very, very good. In fact, it's safer uh, with that because now my center of gravity is lower and uh, it's also a hell of a lot more fun too. And then when you start going uphill or flat, you just hit the switch and pssst, seat goes right up and away you go. Let's see, what else can we answer for you fine folks today? Uh, hey Matt, sometimes when I do deadlifts, I have testicle pain the next day. I got checked out of the doctor and all is okay. Maybe I should cut the exercise out. So here's a great example of what I always talk about when it comes to pain. Now, I don't know about testicular pain. Uh, that's a little bit concerning. Um, I would look maybe towards a uh, hernial issue, perhaps, purely guessing here. But um, whenever we have pain, there's always the temptation to blame the exercise. But just as the exercise is not responsible for your results and the workload of the muscle, it's also not responsible for your injuries. It's how well you're doing the exercise that's responsible for your productivity, but also the injury. So whenever we're doing an exercise, and we're like, oh, this hurts my knees, this hurts my wrist, whatever uh, is going on. That's an opportunity to learn what you're doing wrong, uh, to just put a, a fine point on it. Pain is Mother Nature's way of telling us we're screwing up. It doesn't say that's a bad exercise, especially when you look at it, and you're like, deadlifts are bad for, like, in this case, like, deadlifts are bad for your testicles. And it's like, uh, no, dude, there's like thousands of guys here in this gym who work out every day who never have that kind of pain doing deadlifts. Like, no, they're not <laughs> kind of thing. But uh, we want to look at that and say, okay, something's going on here. And it's your job to figure out what that is. Because if you do not figure out what that is, and you're like, okay, no deadlifts, that's going to, then you could be like, okay, deadlifts, cut it out, no more pain. Fantastic. But that problem that was causing it still exists. And it's still lingering dormant in your body and carrying over to everything else you're doing. Because what is a deadlift? Of course, it's a hinge pattern. You have hip extension, right? Or a carry. You're going to do other exercises with those qualities involved, which means that problem is going to carry over to those other things and potentially get worse. And when it gets worse, then it's going to be a much harder hill to climb back and potentially maybe even go down the road to the point where you're going to need like medical intervention or surgery and all these other sorts of things. I don't know what's wrong with it. So look at what's going on. I would guess there's maybe some sort of a hernial issue going on and there's some uh, intra-abdominal pressure that's leaking down into your pelvic floor. That's my guess. And believe me, it is a guess. I am not a doctor. I literally have no idea. But I'm guessing that's kind of what's going on with that sort of thing. Seek specialty advice and help one-on-one -on -one, uh, for a better diagnosis for sure. But this is an opportunity to learn what's going on because if you don't address it, it's probably going to get worse, unfortunately. Uh, Max Styles doing body weight 
uh, workout, even on alternate days, makes me lethargic and sleepy when I do my academic stuff. Any, st any advice? Yeah, I, <laughs> I hear that funny story here. So this is, oh my God, I'm like a cat in the sun here. Um, I used to do a heavy like squat workout with my shrimp squats and stuff like that. And then I'd get on my laptop. And I'm like, okay, time to write on my book. And we've got the, <laughs> we, at the gym I was working at at the time, we had these leather couches that were just super overstuffed leather couches and the sun would come in and be all nice and warm and toasty and out like a light. <laughs> like I'd get about three sentences in and be like, I'm out. And I would just nap away the afternoon kind of thing. So uh, a couple of things probably going on. One is you may be uh, just simply not getting enough breath, uh, oxygen uh, intake during it. You could also just be working really hard, dude. It's very common. You work really hard. You're going to be tired afterwards. So especially with your nervous system, if you've got a real high neural demand, which is very common with strength training, yeah, that can certainly happen. And when, when we are shifting our gears from our sympathetic to a parasympathetic nervous system, so we're going from fight or flight, which is going on in the workout, to rest and digest, this parasympathetic nervous system, yeah, your, your nervous system's like, great, we went from one end to the next, you sit down and you're like, okay, time to focus on how to create cold fusion or whatever you're studying. But your nervous system is like, oh, great, fantastic, nap time. Let's go order some Chinese and chill kind of thing. But intellectually, you're not chilling, but your body thinks you're chilling. Uh, so a couple of things you could do is um, caffeine uh, can be a good way. Grab some coffee or something if that's something you like to enjoy or you know, it's not like going to keep you up at night, that could be a good way to go about it. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe sit in an environment that's a little bit more stimulating. Like don't have the soft music playing in a super overstuffed couch with the sunbeams coming on you know, kind of thing. Like uh, sit at the kitchen table, put on some super speed acid death metal or something like that. You know, something that kind of keeps your nervous system a little bit more into that fight or flight mode just for a little bit more so you can get your studying done. Max Stewart coming on. Thanks, Max. Big fan of the channel. Thank you very much. I know we disagree on some fitness things, as we should, but I learned a ton from your channels. Then you're a smart guy. He says, yeah, nobody has a monopoly on what the hell is going on in this whole fitness thing, folks. This is the whole reason behind RDP is I'm trying to figure out what the hell's going on. And I sure as hell don't know for uh, to a large degree what's going on. To me, how do we lose weight? How do we build muscle? What the heck's going on? To me, that's just as much of a mystery as how they built the pyramids kind of thing. There's so much we don't know and understand about how fitness works these days. And uh, yeah, and that's why we all have different opinions and different ideas of doing things because we're all d uh, working with different yet incomplete sets of data, sets of experience and sets of approaches. So that's why for those who are like, well, what's the best exercise to build my chest? What's the best you know, way to do this? You're always going to be receiving uh, credible information and data, but it's always incomplete. That's the big lesson I want you to take home from this podcast is that you can get lots of great stuff out there. I've got a lot of good information. It's based on a lot of good data and a lot of good uh, experience. So is everyone else's, right? There's no difference there, but it's always incomplete. It's not right or wrong or you know, up or down or anything, most of it is just incomplete. And the biggest reason why most of it's incomplete is just simply, I don't know you. You know, I could say, okay, this push-up is the best way to build up the chest, but I'm basing that knowing nothing about you. Therefore, the data that I'm working off of is incomplete. And it's your job to fill in the gaps <laughs> with your data and your information. This is the whole Bruce Lee thing of, take what is useful, discard what is not, and add what is uniquely your own. That's how you create a more complete, holistic approach to your own diet and exercise, and also why it's going to be different from everyone else's. Because your data, even though it may be more complete for you, isn't going to be complete for somebody else. <clears throat> Michael, once again, coming on, I'm almost 50 and recently achieved uh, one-arm push-ups. Very good. You're never too old to improve yourself. Amen to that. Because it's important to remember that the body never stops uh, being able to adapt to stimuli. They've taken people in their 90s and they give them strength training routines and they build muscle and they build strength and they become more uh, functionally uh, capable even though they're 
very much in their senior years. We never lose our adaptive abilities. The only thing that changes is the speed and the uh, upper reaches of the degree of that potential adaptation. A couple last questions here real quick. Hey, Matt, what do you think about Chris Harriot? Do you ever watch his videos? Do you like it? I've seen a couple of his stuff. Not enough to have an opinion, though. Uh, not enough to have an opinion. Max Stewart, what do you think about wall handstand push-ups? Do you do them? Uh, no, because my shoulders have never been uh, strong enough. Uh, my shoulder now, and this is why, again, folks, we want to address things that are causing injury. I had a shoulder injury. Um, God, it's probably about 15 years ago at this point kind of thing. And uh, for a good two to three years, like my right arm was almost completely out of commission. Like I couldn't do that. Like I throw darts that would have killed my shoulder. And that was that way for a couple of years. And um, yeah, basically my right shoulder has been woefully weak and unstable most of my life uh, for various reasons. And I would say probably in the past year, not even year, eight months max, have I gotten to a point where it's getting to be more stable. So in, in this is kind of the thing. And again, what I was saying about there's no such thing as a beginner in fitness. Like I've been doing exercise for over 25 years. I've been studying calisthenics for over 30. But as far as my ability to do that with my arms, I've probably been only moderately proficient at it for about eight months. So in that regard, I'm quote a beginner, even though I've been doing other things for, you know, well over a couple of decades. So that's why uh, it's still a very much a work in progress because uh, finally, like after all the, the pain and the, I always kept like, Oh, I'm back to normal. And then I would do some dips and it like, oh, Jesus Christ. Oh, my shoulder. And then it'd be like a six month process to get to the point where I could do dips again, kind of thing. And then uh, I pulled the plug uh, about four months ago and invested in some serious chiropractic care. You know, the shoulder, my back and everything. I'm like, doc, I don't know what's going on, but these things have been plaguing me for years. And uh, finally took my own advice, <laughs> you know, instead of trying to figure it out for myself, like, what the hell is going on? Of course, it has nothing to do with anything I thought was going on. It was all in my neck, believe it or not. And because of that, now my shoulder is actually getting to a place where it is moderately stable and I can start really putting some resistance through it. So hopefully I'll be able to get some of those in the next year or uh, 18 months and stuff. But yeah, it's been a long journey back. And it's been a long journey back because I'm an idiot and I'm stupid, and I didn't seek such professional advice sooner. I thought I could figure it out for myself. And this is why you don't do your own research. Um, rotator cuff you know, weakness or injury, per, purely, I guess, though. To be honest with you, I don't really know. Uh, so I was doing some overhead pressing years ago, and something popped and snapped in that shoulder. And like the egotistical male I am, I ignored it. But here's the thing, is a lot of stuff that we deal with has a much longer history to it. So basically the bottom line is the chiropractor was like, yeah, your neck is out of alignment here and there. And because of that, your shoulder is chronically elevated, slightly protracted in upward rotation. And I was like, that's so weird, right shoulder. I wonder why that is kind of thing. And like literally uh, a month ago, I was like, okay guys, I'll see you later. And I slung a bag over my shoulder like this. And I was like, oh shit. Like, I've been doing that since I was in the earth eighth grade. Like, no wonder my shoulder's messed up. I'm walking around like Quasimodo all the time with a heavy book bag, you know? So I've basically trained myself for 30 years how to have really bad shoulders. So now that I'm finally addressing it and getting it taken care of, the tide is turning, but you're not gonna overcome 30 years of dysfunctional movement patterns in like six months. Ushah, uh, Ushahin. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Hey, Matt, how much carryover do you find to be between horizontal and vertical pulling patterns? A ton, but not very common, but it should be. And this is why, like, I get guff for saying it, but rows and pull-ups are the same thing. Push-ups and dips are the same thing. People are like, no, they're not. I'm like, they should be. And if they're not, you're doing something wrong because fundamentally, they're the same movement pattern. Rows, shoulder extension, elbow flexion, pull-ups, shoulder extension, elbow flexion, right? Fundamentally at the joint, we're doing the same thing. Now, of course, is there some difference? Yes, of course. Our orientation to gravity is a little different and stuff like that. But when it comes to the fundamental movement patterns, push, pull, and squat, 
your goal should be to make all exercises that involve those muscle, those movement patterns as identical as possible. But I know in, especially from our bodybuilding culture, which is what a lot of our strength training and fitness culture is based off of, is that you like, you know, move your hands a millimeter apart and suddenly it's a wildly different exercise. You know, years and years ago, remember Bowflex? I remember when that came out and they were like, this machine can do five gazillion bajillion exercises. And one day I was building a machine because remember I worked in the equipment field in, uh, in a guy's uh, home gym and he had a Bowflex delivered at the same time. It's like, oh, dude, this is one of those new Bowflex kind of things, manual, like that thick. It's like a phone book. Look it up, millennials. Uh, and it's like, oh, it's all these exercises. Let's take a look at what all this could do. And it was literally like every conceivable thing that you could do different. There was like narrow overhand pull up. There was, you know, shoulder width overhand pull up. There was uh, more than shoulder width. There was what? There was like five different exercises, exercises that was just moving the hands about three inches further apart. I'm like, these are not different exercises. <laughs> I was so pissed off and disappointed. I'm like, bullshit, this thing does 500 exercises. It doesn't. It's like you're calling the smallest technical difference a completely different exercise. It's not. When we do our fundamental movement patterns, push, pull, and squat, remember the work of your muscles and the tension in the muscles is governed by your brain. Don't put the exercise in charge. And when it, you recognize this and you're like, okay, biceps work, the elbows bending, the biceps work. Bottom line, I don't care what the exercise is. I don't care what your hand position is. Everything that involves bending your elbow should be a bicep exercise. Once you get good at that, then those exercises, instead of feeling like they're totally different, feel like they're pretty much about the same thing. And when you get to that, not only do you get a lot more functional carryover, but you also get a hell of a lot better at getting what you want from those exercises. Then you just change things up a little bit just for the sake of variety. Like, I don't want to do overhand. I want to do neutral grip today just because why not? I feel like it kind of thing. Good question here. How to ensure progression in calisthenics and martial arts. When we miss sleeping time due to kids, education based on your clients' feedbacks. Yeah, it's really tough. Um, boy, am I learning about sleep. So over the past two years, I've had a job that has gotten me up at roughly 4 a.m. Uh, got to be at the gym, you know, kind of thing. So got to get up at 4 a.m. And for the past couple of years, that's been my life. And now my schedule is a little different for the past couple of months where I'm only getting up at 4 a.m. once a week. And I feel like I'm on flipping steroids. Like, oh my gosh, is this what feeling good feels like? There's no substitute for sleep. When your sleep sucks, you're going to be behind the eight ball. No two ways about it. How do I make it up? You don't. You don't compensate for that. You're just going to be able to do what you can with what you have. And that's basically what you can do is, okay, you're not going to have as much energy. You're not going to have as good a recovery. You're not going to be able to have as much mental focus tough. <laughs> That's life. You know, we don't have an optimal life for fitness most of the time because quite frankly, there are a lot more important things in life than getting in shape, like raising a couple of kids, right? So do what you can with what you have though. Use my micro workouts approach. The new Grindstown calisthenics workout programs coming out on the 1st of December. These are things that are designed to be effective with less time and energy investment. Is it optimal? No, but none of us are going to be able to achieve optimal if we have a normal life. But is it going to be better than what you have? Absolutely, because that's all you need. It's not about doing more work. It's about doing better work. And when you can do better work, I don't care if you give me literally 60 seconds, I can make something work with that. And if you got better pull-ups in that 60 seconds, you're still going to move the needle and improve your strength. Uh, last couple here. These hours always go so fast for me. Gonzalo, how's it going? Love that screenshot, man. Uh, after years of pain at my left knee, pistol squats, your advice, we want to feel like it's kind of like sitting into the hip a bit. Uh, Save my life. Thank you for that from Brazil. Oh, very good. Thank you very much for chiming in from Brazil. Yeah, that, I'm glad that helped because I had a lot of knee pain from pistols as well. And then I used pistols to heal my pain. So going back to the idea of like, the exercise is not causing the problem. It's exposing it. So the ironic thing is I've had all kinds of pains and aches and injuries and problems from exercises. I've had lunges that ruin my knees, pistols that ruin my hip, dips that ruin my shoulder, tricep extensions that ruin my elbows, 
and on and on and on and on. But you know what? It's lunges that healed my knees, pistols that healed my hip, dips that healed my shoulder. The same exercise that caused the problem was the same exercise that fixed the problem because it highlighted what I was doing wrong. And then I use that same exact exercise as a litmus test for, am I using that shoulder back? Am I keeping my lats engaged? Whatever it was as a way to heal it. So that exercise, that's why we don't want to avoid that exercise because usually that exercise is the very solution and not what's actually uh, causing it. <clears throat> COVID question here. Hey Matt, how did you come back from COVID? I feel like crap. Yeah. And not like working out at all. Just did a few pushups to start again. Yeah. It, that's basically it. So I guess I didn't even know this was a thing. It was called long COVID. I didn't even know that existed. I just got on and told about my experience in one of my YouTube videos about how I got sick around New Year's and I pretty much didn't get back on my feet to regular working out until like May. So it was almost four and a half months, almost five months of just feeling like crap. And uh, yeah, that's basically it. Like with the sleep thing, you don't have much energy? Well, do what you can. You know, and yeah, sometimes my workouts were a set of push-ups and a set of lunges, and that was my workout for the day. You know, but you keep going. You keep the needle moving forward. And for the most part, I just, uh, you know, worked on the proficiency of it. I wasn't working the work capacity of my muscles too much. I was just, how do I improve the mobility of my hips? Like the shifting squats I talked about earlier. Like, okay, how do I do better lunges? I'm not going to do lunges until my legs are screaming bloody murder, but how do I do better lunges? Because then when my energy level came back, I was able to pour that proficiency into higher work capacity workouts. And it was like, bang, it was just the slingshot coming right on back. And it was a fantastic uh, way to recover. But yeah, I mean, it's like an injury. Recovering from COVID, it's just, it's going to take what it's going to take, man. Eat good food, get plenty of sleep, you know, all these sorts of things that keep you healthy are the same things that help you recover from virus. But uh, it's going to take what it's going to take. Might be a couple of weeks, I hope, maybe not too long. But if it's going to be six months, it's going to be six months. And uh, I wish you the best of luck with that. Hey, Matt, as a power lifter, is, it, is this a good approach to increase strength for squat, bench, and deadlift? Um, no idea. Uh, no idea. So you've got your rep ranges nice and low. So you're working on strength, um, increase weights five to 10 pounds and restart to four by four. So there's a lot you're leaving out here. So weight and reps are very important, but they're not even close to sufficient enough because it's how are you doing those reps? How are you lifting that weight? How well are you doing those exercises? That's what gets you strong. Weight and reps, to be honest with you, that's like the secondary thing I think about. You know, to, to a large degree, I don't even pay attention to that stuff very much. If we were working together, I'd be like, all right, let's take a look at your technique and let's take a look at your stability. Strength is going to come from stability. So I would do what it, that plan, do whatever plan you like. I don't really care. But how much control and stability do you have during those repetitions? That's where your strength's going to come from, my friend. So if you're getting, let's say you've got the six by six and that last set, those six are kind of shaky dakey then improve the stability of those six. That's what's going to do it. It's not about your rep range. It's not about re reps and sets and so forth. It's going to be much more about how well are you doing those things. But yeah, I mean, a standard program protocol there, very good, balanced. Yeah, great, wonderful. The only thing a program needs to be is practical so you can do it and balanced. That's it. <laughs> it's like a launch pad for a rocket. It's just got to point you in the right direction. But whether or not you launch off into the results you want depends on how well you are doing the program. <clears throat> Der, uh, I'm not even going to try with that. Sorry, man. Uh, I believe doing the basics, the fundamentals, yes, like pull-ups, push-ups, rows, dips, especially weighted progressions develop a lot of strength. Absolutely. Personally, I prefer weighted push-ups over weighted dips. Yeah, I, you know, I go back and forth. I, you know, I'll have weeks where if you ask me, what are you doing? Oh, I love these push-ups. These are awesome. These are wonderful couple of weeks later, what are you doing? Nothing beats dips. Dips are the best. And that's another reason why like taking advice from some jack off like me about what the best exercise is, is, is kind of foolish because you ask me different times, I'm going to give you different answers. Like Nothing better than dips. Dips are the best thing for the chest. Awesome. They're wonderful. They're great. You should be doing dips. Come after me six months from now. Matt, what are you doing? Nothing better than push-ups. Push-ups are the best thing. And like, I keep getting conflicting messages because ultimately it's not about the exercise people. It really isn't. It's about using your muscles, using your muscles in a safe, 
comfortable and powerful way and do whatever you want to help you achieve that. If you find that you can do that with different exercises, different routines or whatever, do it that way because those are the things that really matter, not whether or not you're doing something that some champion, you know, so-and-so did this and he's jacked. So what? Are you them? No, then it doesn't have any relevance to you whatsoever. Let's see. Um, <clears throat> I know I could keep going on forever and ever and ever and ever. One more here just because I know this. Oh, here's one I got a good answer for. Isaac, what does an average workout look uh, like for you? How many sets usually are the exercises? Simple. I don't have one. Uh, I don't have any such thing as an average exercise. You could watch me work out every single day this next coming year, and you'd be like, what the hell are you doing? There's no consistency to it. There is. You just don't see it. You're not reading between the lines. But um, yeah, I don't have any sort of con regular anything that I do. Um, I stick to the fundamental movement patterns. I keep pretty much to my grind style four-phase strategy, but uh, every day is very, 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 very different. Uh, anyway, uh, last one here, dips destroyed my chest. Is there a good rehab program to follow? Depends on how it destroyed your chest. So keep in mind that your dips are very much a mobility exercise. They're like the squat for the upper body. So you probably strain something. So use things that are lighter and less range of motion. Incline push-ups typically, light dumbbell bench press or barbell bench press. So that way you're not coming down very far. Anything that's going to be shorter range, lighter weight just to get the blood in the muscle kind of thing, speed up that healing a little bit. Um, and then you ease your way back in. You're just kind of overreached with those dips. Uh, too heavy, too big a range of motion too soon. Uh, you, muscles just didn't have the resiliency for it. And then you'll build yourself back and go beyond what, quote unquote, destroyed uh, the, the chest to begin with. Oh, what the hell, one more. Kirsten, hey Matt, do you, ha uh, do, you do your stability and isometrics for each muscle group before each exercise? Or can you do all the stability and isometrics at once before the dynamic exercises? Yeah, either way. Either, either way. You watch because uh, uh, the Grind Style Calisthenics program, month 12 is coming out, and then we'll have the full year. If you look at all 12 of those programs, there are different variations of exactly that. You could do one, then the other. You could do them together. You could superset them. As long as you're getting it, again, muscles are nails. As long as you hit it, you're getting the job done. All right, folks, I've got another Friendsgiving to head off to and eat a lot of more food. But thank you very much, everybody, for coming on. It's always a pleasure, as always. Uh, thoughts, comments, questions down below so I can answer them for you. If you have anything you want to send to me directly, reddeltaproject at gmail.com is how you can reach me. Don't forget the sponsor for this week's episode, Dunamic Pull-Up Handles, the Elvia. Highly recommended. Pretty much the only doorway apparatus I uh, recommend. Uh, code or uh, the uh, link down below. Use the promo code GRINDSTYLE to receive 10% off. And uh, I will talk to you folks next week. Till then, be fit and live free. <laughs>